My name is Morris Goodman, and it's again my distinct privilege and pleasure to welcome you tonight to the next in our series of COVID webinars brought to you by SAMA, SAPPF, UFFP, and Discovery. We thank you for taking from your valuable personal and professional time to attend. Just to update you again on the attendance stats that I've shared with you during previous webinars, this is now our 16th webinar in the series, which has been viewed by more than 27,000 colleagues who've rated these webinars at a 95% excellence rating on average. And by attending, you've earned over 18,000 CPD points. So thank you so much for your support and we'll continue to work hard to ensure that you continue to derive benefit from these webinars. <clears throat> Before we get into the topic for tonight, I'd just like to remind you again of the house rules. The webinar is of course CPD accredited and certificates take approximately a week to get to you. Any queries that you do have in this regard can be sent to cpd at discovery.coza. All these webinars are made available on the Discovery website under the tab for healthcare professionals. Uh, we ask you, please do participate by asking questions during the session. And to do so, please use the Q&A tab and not the chat tab. Uh, please also understand that questions typically come in high volume. So what we do in the background is we collate and curate these uh, and address them thematically rather than individually. And in so doing, we endeavor to get through as many of the questions raised as possible. And then finally, please look out for the poll at the end of the talk so that we can keep close tabs on your ratings and ensure that we continue to bring you topics of value. So <clears throat> tonight's session is particularly meaningful to us as it features both an alumnus as well as partners of our Discovery Foundation. Uh, many of you will know of the Discovery Foundation, which was established some 14 years ago to contribute to the ongoing excellence of South Africa's clinician scientists, researchers, and academics. We are very proud that our moderator this evening is one of our earliest alumni, and our guests are our partners from Harvard's Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, who host the recipients of our postdoctoral fellowship award. They testify to the world-class nature of South Africa's clinician scientists. So although it's going to take me just a few minutes longer than usual, it is a huge pleasure for me to present to you the world-class resumes of our illustrious participants in this evening's session, which is entitled Using Global and Regional Data to Guide Individual Clinical Decisions. The webinar will be led by Professor Nambulele Magula in conversation with Professor Louise Ivers and Professor Vanessa Carey of Harvard's Massachusetts General Hospital. Prof Magula is head of the Department of Internal Medicine at UKZN. She has oversight responsibility for undergraduate and postgraduate training, including clinical services in internal medicine for the province of KwaZulu-Natal. She was awarded the Fogarty Fellowship and completed a Master's of Science in Clinical Research at the Graduate School of Biomedical Science, uh, Sciences at Tufts University in Boston, Massachusetts, USA. As a Discovery Foundation Fellow, she completed her PhD at the University of uh, KwaZulu-Natal. She serves as a section editor for the HIV section of the European Society of Cardiology textbook of cardiovascular medicine, the third edition. And she also serves as a key opinion leader for the Etiquini Municipality for Fast Track Cities for the International Association for Providers of AIDS Care, IPAC. And in collaboration with the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS, uh, UNA AIDS. Working at Working towards attaining the UN AIDS 1990 goal to end HIV as a public health threat. She's the chairperson of the KwaZulu Natal Provincial Clinical Management Core Committee for COVID 19 and a member of the South African Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID 19. Professor Ivers is the executive director of the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Global Health an Associate Professor of Global Health 
and Social Medicine and an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, an Associate Physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases at MGH, and an Associate Physician in the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham, Women's, Brigham and Women's Hospital. She's a Special Advisor for Partners in Health, an international nonprofit organization that provides direct health care and social services to poor communities around the world, supported by research and advocacy. She completed medical school at University College Dublin in Ireland, residency in internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital, and a fellowship in infectious diseases at the combined MGH BWH program. Prof. Ivers also earned a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, a master's degree in public health from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and a research doctorate in medicine from the National University of Ireland. <clears throat> and finally, completing the very impressive trio is Professor Kerry, who is the co-founder and CEO of Seed Global Health, a nonprofit that focuses on the power of investing in health and the health workforce for social well being and economic growth to positively transform countries. Through partnerships with governments and in country academic institutions, under Vanessa's tenure, SEED has helped train more than 17,000 doctors, nurses, and midwives and has impacted hundreds of thousands of lives. <clears throat> Seed's impact, <clears throat> excuse me, Seed's impact is rooted in its unique leveraging model that not only provides better care to patients, but also trains future generations, supports the health sector, and catalyzes change in the health system. She graduated from Yale University and Harvard Medical School with honors, completing her clinical training at Mass General, General Hospital, where she continues to work as a physician and the Associate Director of Partnerships and Global Initiatives at MGH Global Health. She earned her master's degree in health policy, planning and financing from the London School of Economics and Hygiene and, uh, and of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And Prof Kerry's work has been featured at conferences in print, online and in the media, including the Aspen Ideas Festival, the World Health Assembly, NPR, MSNBC and Marie Claire, the New England Journal of Medicine, the New York Times and the Lancet. She is a Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation social entrepreneur and World Economic Forum young global leader. She serves on the President's Council for International Activities at Yale University and is one of 24 inaugural Fellows of Women Lift Health, awarded by Stanford University and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So as you can see, <clears throat> it took me a few minutes longer than usual, but I really uh, think it's important to stress the, the uh, very high caliber of, of the panel this evening. And with that, uh, over to you, Prof Magula. Thank you, Dr. Morris Goodman for this introduction and uh, greetings to Professor Ivers and Professor Kerry. Greetings to colleagues that have joined in uh, this webinar. So just a few months ago, we had absolutely no idea that our lives would have been um, disrupted in the way that they have. Uh, so we're looking forward this evening uh, to learning from each other's experiences and uh, we all share this collective history through the Discovery Foundation of supporting specialists um, through their journey to becoming academic clinicians. Uh, and so Prof Kerry, please could you share with us your experience with South African clinicians uh, and, and also the value of countries investing in specialist training, especially in the context of pandemics. And Prof Ivers, if you could share with us your experience in global health, as well as the importance of countries investing in, in, in global health. Um, 
Professor Ivers, do you want to start or would you like me to, I can, I can start. Um, good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be able to join you all. And I'm, it's especially poignant for me to be able to participate in this particular webinar because of the long relationship between Discovery Health and the Massachusetts General Hospital and the MGH Center for Global Health. Um, MGH being short for Mass General Hospital, so forgive me if I use some acronyms. But um, we've had a deep privilege to, so the Mass General Hospital has been founded on this idea of 200 years of investing in education, um, clinical care and research and really building that forth to provide service to our local community and to our global community, which is being done under Professor Otter's leadership now. And, um, and so as part of that, we've had the honor of partnering with Discovery Health to host uh, leading academic clinicians from South Africa to come spend a year at Mass General Hospital for a year of observership and a year of research in different specialties. We've hosted um, outstanding clinician scientists to date, including um, Dr. Nelly Gogella, who was one of our first, uh, was the first Discovery Fellow who did an advanced liver fellowship um, and transplant fellowship with us. We've hosted someone who's looking at the, the microbiome and its effect on pediatric pneumonia. We had a pulmonary critical care specialist looking at pulmonary hypertension. Um, we had um, Dr. Salome Masimwe who did uh, incredible work looking at, uh, you know, maternal child health, specifically maternal health. Um, and doing research in that and has gone on to, you know, really become a leader in the South African health system. Uh, we had another GI specialist who came as well. So we've had a, a very, and we had a pain in the anesthesiologist last year um, uh, who came, Dr. Sean Chetty, who came and looked at pain management, thinking about what does it mean to expand pain management, not only in South Africa, but he's been tasked with thinking about what is pain management and palliative care look like across much of Southern Africa. And so the impact of these fellowships is tremendous. And we've been very privileged at Mass General to be a part of that journey. Needless to say, I think that the importance of training uh, the healthcare workforce is, is critical in this moment, because for many years, there've been investments in health that have focused on scaling up medicines, building clinics, uh, sort of access to resources. Then we went through the phase where, oh, we'll fly in, we'll help some people out and we'll fly away and we feel good about ourselves. What needs to happen though is to ensure that every country has the robust, well-distributed uh, healthcare workforce that it needs to deliver care from the farthest mile to your tertiary centers at the highest level. And in 2020, no country should really have to live with a substandard level of care. We have the capability to do this. It's a question of making the investment. And so that means everything from community health workers to your cardiac specialist or your pain specialist um, that, that we've been focusing on in our partnership with Discovery. Training specialists is critical, not even just in this COVID moment, but in general, because when you look at the leading causes of death worldwide and the growing leading causes of death on a continent like Africa or in South Africa, cardiovascular disease is now one of the leading killers worldwide. The fifth leading killer is pulmonary disease and the third leading killer is malignancy. So we know that there is a shift in diseases that is happening that we are all going to have to confront. COVID is very tricky because it is a disease of public health in that we need to socially distance, we should wear masks and wash our hands well. And if we can achieve those three things, we can do a great job at preventing COVID. But when somebody does get sick with COVID and if they fall into that 20% that is gonna of, of people who are affected who will develop severe disease, then we start to need more advanced care and specialists um, as you get more and more sick to help address that disease. So we know as we look forward into our future that having specialists that are well-trained and responsive to the moment is gonna be critically important. So I think, and further, the investment in a specialist becomes an investment in your future pipeline. Because when you train one doctor or highly skilled nurse or midwife, they get to train their successors with the same skill and adaptation um, to the moment that is critically important. And so uh, we've been so thrilled to work with Discovery to be able to host these folks and to, and to help be part of a bilateral exchange 
from which we learn and hopefully we also help invest. Thanks Thank for that. You, I mean, I was, um, oh yeah, I was going to just add, should I add a few comments to that? Is that okay? Great. I, I mean, so my, I'm trained as an infectious diseases physician myself. Um, and I've spent a lot of my career really working in other epidemics, uh, HIV, tuberculosis. I've spent a lot of time over the last 10 years working in Haiti. Uh, which, if you're for, for, uh, forgetting your geography, is a pretty small country, about 10 million people in the Caribbean, that's had a huge cholera epidemic over the last 10 years. Um, and I think what's so interesting about the discussion about specialists and generalists is that, you know, so much of the daily work of caring for patients is done by generalists. And so it's a huge... Um, burden of the work, let's say, and it's done very, very well by generalists. And what I think we are seeing as well with the COVID pandemic is that both for caring for patients and for the advancement of science, it's really important to have specialists in your armamentarium. Um, because what we have found at Mass General, and we really had our peak of cases in COVID, and I, I know we're going to come back to this, in March and April, but we had so many people working as generalists to take care of patients, and we were able to free up a little some really highly specialized people in many specialties, critical care, like Vanessa, Professor Carey works in infectious diseases, but also cardiology, uh, hematology, nephrology, to really hone in on the subspecialty areas of how can we make sure we're taking care of these patients. And both the care of patients and the scientific questions about COVID really, I think, has been helped to be advanced by having those specialists uh, in the armamentarium. And I think we see this in every country where I've worked, whether it's in Ireland, where I'm from, or the US, or Haiti and other parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Though I've never, I've been to South Africa, but I've never, cared for patients in South Africa, but having specialists as part of the team is just a really important piece of the health system, health system puzzle, let's say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Prof um, Kerry and Prof Ivers. So I just want to now take us through some of the challenges that we're experiencing and, and just hear some of your views on these. So South Africa's response to COVID-19 is constrained by laboratory capacity, impacting on efforts both upstream uh, into clinical care, as Prof. Kerry has uh, indicated, uh, and, and downstream with respect to contact tracing and limiting sp infection spread. If, you were, if we were living in the pre-technology era, one assumes that the response to this pandemic would have focused more heavily on quarantine based on symptoms rather than laboratory testing that we're relying on. So what do you see as a role of symptom-based quarantine as a country's strategic response to COVID-19 to bridge the gap between those that are prioritized for testing and those that do not meet priority criteria. Shall I go? Who will go first? <laughs> Why don't I jump in? So I think when I think of testing, I think we should think about testing as both caring for patients and the type of test we need to take care of a patient and to manage patients with a highly contagious infectious disease in our hospital systems and in our facilities as one challenge. And then testing that needs to happen for in the communities and as part of disease control in a, in a fashion that's more related to mass surveillance. So in some ways, I think, especially in the US, we've been focusing a lot on getting better and better and more highly sophisticated tests that are very reliable. And we haven't really focused enough on having a test that's good enough for mass surveillance so that we can test in schools and test in communities. I think to get at your specific question, 
quarantining symptomatic people is definitely a strategy that we use in public health a lot. <clears throat> and I think, however, we're really, and this is an important tool. It, it has its limits though in this particular infection because of the fact that we have a fairly large amount of transmission that's happening in people who are either <clears throat> asymptomatic, meaning they will never develop symptoms, and people who are pre-symptomatic, so they don't have symptoms, but they are infectious and they will develop symptoms. And quite a big proportion of transmission is believed to be happening in that group. And so I do agree with the notion that anyone with a respiratory illness or symptoms like loss of smell or changes in taste, some of those very early symptoms should really be quarantining. Um, <clears throat> And let's come back to what it means to be able to quarantine. But I think, and I think that would get you quite a ways forward in controlling the reproductive rate of the pandemic. However, it's likely <clears throat> to still create a challenge because of those asymptomatic transmitters. And then I'll just finally mention, because I think we'll also come back to discussing this a little, is you know, being able to quarantine has been also a huge challenge for us in, in many of our communities. And it's really been part of the way that we have seen disparities in health uh, and social determinants really amplified in this pandemic um, in the US, where challenges for quarantine related to income or work or food security or childcare have really impacted which communities have been most affected. So in short, I really think quarantining based on symptoms is very important, but it's not sufficient, but it should get some of the way. Um, thank you, and I apologize. My daughter came barreling up um, with a long promised distraction while I was on this webinar. But um, I, uh, I would fully agree. I mean, I think it's interesting because in a lot of the communities around the United States, we've not had enough testing to be able to manage you know, knowing who is sick in the community and who's not. And so we've certainly relied on one, just three basic tenets of you know, how to manage the COVID, which is wear a mask everywhere, wash your hands all the time, and continue to socially distance even when we are not in a lockdown in community. And that should go a long way to helping the trends for stop the spread of transmission, even if so Sick, but if we all follow those rules, you should still not transmit COVID readily. Um, and so those are really, really important principles to managing this epidemic, no matter what the context or situation. I think separately though, in places where there's been suspicion for a COVID case, somebody does present symptomatic and testing has not been available. It certainly has been done through symptom screening, but one of the things that has been utilized a lot actually is, is been a um, pulse oximeter. Because one of the things we know in COVID is that people may not necessarily feel like they're short of breath because they are, it's a funny pathophysiology of the disease that people are actually able to, um, you know, people are able to breathe comfortably because they're not having sort of elevated rises in CO2 per se, but they aren't oxygenating well. So you'll put the O2 probe on and they will have a shockingly low, what we call silent hypoxia happening. And so that actually has been a very powerful, not overwhelmingly expensive and reusable tool that can be built into the armamentarium of deciding if somebody has COVID or not. I think in this case, when in doubt, you have COVID and, and you should behave as such to the degree that you are able to. And I think what safe and supported quarantine looks like as Prof. Ivers has pointed out, is a little tricky. Um, but again, if you go back to the basic principles of wear a mask, wash your hands, and stay distant as possible, even in the setting of someone being infected, you should be able to diminish transmission. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. That is so helpful. Thank you very much for those insights. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll come now to cardiovascular disease and, and mental fitness, which um, Prof. Kerry, have already touched on this. So cardiovascular and mental fitness, including overall optimal management of underlying diseases are paramount 
in attaining optimal clinical outcomes. Are we paying enough attention globally on these factors as part of a pandemic armamentarium? So, I mean, I think it's the thing about COVID for me that has been so fascinating is that I think it has absolutely stripped bare all the vulnerabilities in our health systems and the way we've organized our health systems in many countries across the board. So just speaking from the U.S. experience, we certainly have not put much primacy on primary care or on preventative care and on protecting people from developing some of these comorbidities that we know make you so sick in COVID. So we know that your risk of dying in COVID goes up if you're over 80, like much more markedly. And, you know, 70 to 80, it's worse. It, you know, progressively improves. And at about 50, you start to get a sharp drop off. We're seeing a huge host of critical illness in young people now, but that's mainly behaviorally related and people not protecting themselves and just a sheer numbers. But your risk of dying certainly goes up with age, but it also goes up with comorbidity. So cardiovascular disease, malignancy, immunocompromised, diabetes, obesity are really big ones that we have seen. Um, and so prevention will help you in COVID, but it takes years of prevention, right? So I think that we do have a moment, though, to take a pause about how we want to reorganize our health systems in general to set ourselves up for better health and wellness, which brings me to the second point. Mental health is critically important to our ability to care for ourselves, to care for our family, to have lower blood pressures, to have a stronger immune system, um, and to be able to really function and, and to care for ourselves in a way that we need to. Mental health has long been stigmatized. I'm actually the daughter of a mental health advocate. My mother um, wrote a book about depression uh, in the late 80s at a time when nobody was talking about it. And for me, that has always been so momentous because it really started to kind of open up the cracks of the stigma that we carry about depression, about PTSD, about trauma, about um, all sorts of other you know, mental health issues and stress being one of them, which can be quite pathologic. Yeah, a third of the world's morbidity and mortality has been attributed to mental health. And so I think that, um, you know, the, the ability for us to embrace that as a very real component of our overall well-being is very, very important, especially in a pandemic where people are living with immense amounts of fear, depression will be heightened, um, you know, I think that we don't know the data yet because it's not getting reported, but a lot of worries about what's happening with domestic abuse. Um, Prof. Fivers, I don't, I, I know you. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I, maybe I'll just add um, to complement that a couple of additional thoughts. You know, it just reminded me, uh, two things that we're reminded of as we were talking here. One is that, you know, for patients and families in the hospital, this has been a very, very distressing uh, time, you know, not just from their own illness, but also the fact that they have not been able to have their families with them in the hospital. And, you know, to drop off your family member at the hospital and not to be allowed in, and then to have these interactions by phone with nursing staff helping you walk through potentially your family members last hours and minutes has been very stressful for both families and obviously the sick people and the healthcare workers. And I think, you know, a couple of things that our hospital system did, one was to introduce palliative care teams into the emergency department and to really have frontline palliative care teams having conversations about end of life very early in the emergency room with people, especially as we were reaching the peak of our cases. And we, we never reached the scenario in which we ran out of ventilators or intensive care units. I think we were very lucky. And we can talk about some of the steps I think Mass General took to help us in that situation. But, you know, the, the caring of the mental health and the wellness of a patient was very disrupted by the pandemic, by the PPE, by the isolation. And then just to echo what Prof. Carey said, you know, the, the well-being of healthcare workers, I mean, my observation is that when you're already working in a limited, resource-limited setting, where you as a healthcare provider are making um, resource allocation decisions 
at the front line, which I think is what a lot of healthcare providers have to do in many health systems where resources are limited. It's a very stressful scenario to begin with. And then when we add these additional pressures, plus our own challenges, working at home, caring for our families, having our own sick family members, investing in the pandemic times in the wellness of the healthcare staff, as well as protecting them you know, with PPE from the physical infection, it's so, it's so important. And we had a very, um, we had a, you know, a, an emergency medicine a, a consultant doctor in New York who, who died by suicide um, a month or so ago. And, you know, there was a very <clears throat> in-depth conversation about that in the New York Times. And I think it prompted a lot of discussion on our side about the stigma within healthcare provider communities about mental health. So I think, you know, as Prof. Carey is talking about reassessing our entire health systems for non-communicable diseases and so prevention and so many other things, I think also it's really triggered a conversation about wellness and mental health within the healthcare uh, community as well. Yes, thank you so much for those, uh, it, yeah those comments and and we actually see a, a a situation where even the 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 public is scared to come into facilities and unable to stay on their medication and uh you know out, out of the fear of the pandemic which is then creating another problem as well so just moving on uh to talk about uh, uh um you know, monitoring of, of patients once they are in the health system, once they are in, 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 in facilities. Can you share your experiences on using data pro to appropriately respond to the pandemic and effect better clinical outcomes? In particular, surveillance of clinical monitoring of organ function for early prom and prompt interventions, thus enabling support to resource constrained regions. That's a big one. Um, I think <laughs> uh, I, I think that you know I um, so in the case of COVID in particular, this has been such a rapidly evolving learning process, and I think one of the dangers of what has happened is that huge amounts of data, which I will put in quotes, and sort of anecdotal evidence and small studies and observational studies have been put out through mainstream mechanisms that they published and people are grasping for hope. And so, you know, there's the observational study, that, the retrospective study that came out in France on 26 patients and the use of hydroxychloroquine and Azithro and everybody did really well. And suddenly hydroxychloroquine is flying off the shelves and we were trying to use it with everybody. And then it's two months later, we discovered people were dying of heart arrhythmias and prolonged QTs, and maybe it wasn't actually the be all end all answer. And then we got yo-yoed back again because the Henry Ford um, Medical Center released another study that again was an observational study saying actually they had reduced mortality with hydroxychloroquine. So I think what we have done at Mass General has been to create um, sort of committees that have been assigned to really evaluate the data. And um, as Prof. Iver said, you, you know, the other day, it's been daily for a while. Now it's a little bit less than daily. And what they're really doing is looking at the quality of data. They are looking at the how that data measures up with what we know about similar disease processes and previous studies. So for example, we didn't use steroids for the longest amount of time because there's no real indication, at least in the US, the practice was not to use steroids in ARDS. And we felt COVID was an ARDS-like syndrome, so we weren't using steroids. And then the, the recovery trial just came out that showed a pretty clear indication that Decadron may actually play a role when you know, given and that you actually can have much lower mortality. And because Decadron taken into account too, it's not that expensive. The side effect profile is not that terrible. Um, there was a, we've now started using Decadron in patients who require supplemental oxygen and are in the hospital. Um, I think that we don't use it though, for example, still from day four, past day 14 because of the Lazarus trial, which had looked at steroid use in area. So that's just an example of where we're trying to use new data 
to, to, to supply old data, um, I mean, against old data to come up with a, a best case recommendation or a best practices. And oftentimes we're still just adapting to the patient that is in front of us to make the right best clinical decision. I think in terms of how it becomes adaptable to the you know, settings that maybe don't have access to the same resources, um, it's been trickier because I think the one thing that has been striking for me in COVID, um, and this is a, a global question beyond what I think say Mass General has been doing or other organizations have been doing um, and try who really do focus on working in this part of the world. But I think in general, many institutions and places have been so overwhelmed by their own COVID. This is the first time we've had an epic pandemic that has truly sort of spanned so many countries that I think people have had a hard time lifting their heads up from what's right in front of them to think about how they support. The WHO has certainly been trying to provide recommendations and guidance going forward, but I think the dissemination of knowledge that we learn and bringing together best practices to support all communities around the globe, whether it's rural communities in the United States or say supporting conversation in South Africa, um, we've certainly tried to do at Mass General Center for Global Health, um, the Durant Fellowship I mean, the Durant um, uh, series was a technical series of webinars that, that the Mass General Center for Global Health put out very early in the pandemic to bring together people to think about best practices for PPE use, for workflow, for um, management of, you know, or ICU care in, in less resource limited settings. How do you triage? And I think so we've made efforts to try to provide that there's a series of web resources now that have gone up that try to provide best practices. Um, the covidhub.io, I mean, covidhub.io has a series of videos, best practices, um, and, and sort of a collection of vetted resources that are available to all. So I, th I think that um, data is helpful. The trouble with data and a lot of the studies out there is though, to date, they've been conducted in very particular settings with very particular populations, and none of us know the applicability of it, even within our own communities where we might clinically practice, let alone to resource-limited settings. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the, the, the microphone to Professor Ivers, who I know will have much to add. So. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think you've captured it all really because especially in March and April, we were even, you know, earlier in our scientific and clinical understanding. And I think everybody really just was trying to take care of the patient in front of them as best they could with so much unknown. And a lot of the very sick patients were really, you know, in intensive care units. So we, Mass General Hospital has 1,000 beds and we had uh, about half of our inpatients had COVID at a certain moment. And our, our, we had 180, 180 intensive care unit patients with COVID at one moment. And so, you know, we had kind of the kitchen sink of options for patients, but we had a group of experts uh, who really each day were meeting and trying to help um, for us or for those who were on the front line who were in the ICU or who were trying to help us distill the information into something that was digestible. Because even as an infectious diseases specialist, I mean, the amount of information coming is just overwhelming. I cannot keep up. You know, I tell people, oh, you know, I'm up to date up to two weeks ago, but who knows what's happening, you know, things are changing so fast. But I think the main principles have been that generally speaking, caring for the patients is supportive care. And then whether remdesivir is available and who has access to it and how many doses we have in our pharmacy versus using dexamethasone, those are the pieces that have been kind of changing a little more up to date. The one other area that we certainly did have to try to also use the data that was available to us to make some clinical decisions was around the community prevalence. So in Massachusetts, where we are, the first diagnosed case was on February 1st. And then we really didn't have testing very much available and cases started to escalate really one month later. And we still didn't really have good testing available. So for our inpatients, 
we had to make a lot of decisions as to whether we thought we could really treat the person as suspected COVID and, you know, whether we should be isolating them and putting them into infection control prevention measures or not, really based on what we understood the community transmission to be. So at the height of our um, peak in Massachusetts, maybe it will be the first peak, but the peak we've had, um, we had a number of patients who were testing negative, but we really thought based on their chest X-ray or their chest CT or their clinical course that they really did have COVID and we treated them as such. Um, so I think that's the other place where what's going on in the community really has to influence your decision as to whether the patient actually has it or actually doesn't have it, even when you don't have the full testing that you wish you had. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And while we are on um, the clinical trials and management, I'll pick up on a question that's come from uh, clinicians that have joined in. And the question is, what are the suggestions for treatment options of mild disease? Um, where should where steroids should be avoided? I think to, to pick up on Prof Ivers's point, it's really supportive care. So I think it's um, if you know again, it's I think really ensuring they're not obviously hypoxic at any point or having that nocturnal hypoxia. So if there's the ability to have a pulse oximeter or some kind of monitoring. Uh, you know, albuterol has probably been the one tool we've sort of had to try to relieve symptoms, even though we know this is not a particularly bronchospastic um, sort of process, but I think it has provided some relief for folks. Um, because I practice in an ICU, to be really candid, I don't do a lot of mild disease. <laughs> I see people who are either intubated or on the cusp of intubation. So. Um, I'm much better speaking at that particular point. So I, I don't know, Prof. Ivers, if you have something more to add. Uh, I think, you know, certainly my bias is also the, the hospitalized patient. But I think when we think about steroids and respiratory illness, you know, we just, I, I, the study we have really is focused on more seriously ill patients. So even our own understanding of now using dexamethasone versus not is really focused on that. So I don't think, to my knowledge, we really have data to guide us on whether to use steroids or not in milder cases. I think the risk, of course, could be, especially if you don't have diagnostic tools, if the person might have a different infection, I think in South Africa, you also have, you know, a burden of disease related to uh, tuberculosis that we don't have to also co-manage in our cohorts of patients. And I think how, whether, you know, latent tuberculosis, subclinical tuberculosis, undiagnosed tuberculosis might impact the course of disease is something that you and your scientists are really going to have to help us understand better for, for the patients we have with it. So... I think, you know, both Prof. Kerry and I are a little bit um, hedging on the question of steroids for mild disease because I think we're in a bit of a data-free scenario on that one. So I'm sorry we can't uh, exactly tell you. Yeah, so I guess we can look at it from a perspective of, um, you know, what it is that we are achieving with this because we're trying to reduce to dampen the inflammatory response. And that is happening in the moderate to severe illness. And the risk in the milder uh, stages of disease is that of actually increasing a viral replication. So I think it actually would not be safe to be administering. And, and the recovery trial uh, has actually shown benefit in those patients that have more uh, severe disease who are already on oxygen. So let's move on to uh, another question from, from, from clinicians is that uh, how can, with respect to prevention and isolation, how can we ensure continued health services in a setting with a limited workforce and their infection risk? These are some of the challenges we face. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I mean, this is a huge challenge. And I think there are two pieces to it. One is the crowding out of the health system by COVID. And I think we see this in 
outbreaks, whether they're more regional or local. Um, in the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, far more women died of immature mortality, far more children had malaria because they weren't able to access the health system. And I think we are going to see the impact of that in the US shortly. I think we're already seeing it. I haven't seen the, the data on it, but I think people not only were afraid to come in for non-COVID illnesses, but we actually delayed. We canceled elective surgeries. We postponed visits. We had the opportunity to really um, take advantage of fairly good internet access, though it's not consistently good for everyone, uh, to, to move to telehealth for many visits. But I do think we're going to see the downstream impact on the health system um, outside COVID. In terms of in the hospital, you know, again, you have this huge challenge of trying to deal with an illness where some infectious people have no symptoms. So if you come in for a road traffic accident, you now need to have a screening for COVID because we have at a certain point, I mean, again, this depends on what the community transmission is like and at different points of your epidemic curve, you wouldn't do that. But certainly in April, we're testing every person who came to the hospital because we're afraid to put an infectious asymptomatic person in a room with a you know, totally different illness. And to get at that, I think we have to have strategies that are really protecting healthcare workers. So, you know, you have to, you, ha you have to really prioritize the physical protection of healthcare workers with PPE. I mean, I think that has to be an absolute priority for health systems because when your healthcare workers start getting sick, you're losing healthcare workers, which are a precious resource and you're also really losing morale. And again, another really good step, I think that our leaders took in our hospital system was very, very early on made the decision to have universal masking. So really they took a risk on this because we didn't have data, but it just seemed to make sense. Everyone entering the building wore a mask. And this really has reduced our, just that simple step, universal masking, uh, and, and Prof. Kerry keeps talking about this, you know, wearing a surgical mask, surgical mask when you enter the building, hand washing other things has really helped to protect health, healthcare workers in general. Um, but how to, you know, how to triage in a facility without tests, you're, you're, you are going to have nosocomial transmission in that case. So again, when we go back to maybe even the first question you asked, in the community, you know, quarantining for symptomatic people at home and using tests that maybe are not perfect, that could be okay. But within the facility, it's really important to try to protect those who don't have COVID from those who do and the health workers by investing in PPE and investing in the test, in a, in a kind of testing that's good strategy that's going to work. Prof. Carey? I, I know, I mean, I think you've covered much of it. I mean, I think there is some nitty gritties of how one can protect your healthcare workforce. It, certainly without question, the universal surgical mask policy, it went on when you walked in the building, you kept it on all day. If you ate or you drank, you had to be six feet away from people, not in a clinical area. Um, all food in the cafeteria was individually wrapped, individually packaged, no more salad bars, communal anything. Um, all of those kinds of practices, I think, went a long way. And our rate of positivity dropped dramatically among our healthcare workforce. There's a second layer, though, that one has to think about, which is who is high risk for aerosolized procedures. And those folks would be prioritized to get what were very limited N95s in April, March and April we were under an N95 restriction in terms of how much we could use them. You got one for the day. You had to figure out how to take it on and put it off and save it and not contaminate the strings and yourself. And we were carrying them around in little, what we call them hot dog dishes because they like hold our hot dogs at the ballpark um, and sort of, you know, and, and, and there were ways to sort of do this, but I, I think then surgeons who did have to continue operating, they had to decide how aerosolized their surgery was going to be. 
So if they were doing something in the nose or the upper airway, they wore N95s. People doing a leg might not do an N95. Uh, during labor and delivery, there was a real push to wear N95s as well because there was some concern during that there might be aerosolization of blood during kind of the moments of delivery or placenta delivery that was it was a little bit more involved than say a standard surgery. Um, and those are decisions that I would encourage every clinical setting to kind of really parse out when you are going to have limited PPE, but you also have to protect your workforce. I just really want to underscore Prof. Fiverr's point that the investment in PPE, while it might feel overwhelming in terms of what you need, is far less the investment of training a new healthcare workforce, keeping morale up, and all the other things that will happen if you start to lose your workforce, um, you know, to COVID. Thank you so much. Please, can you share your thoughts with us on the opening of schools? <laughs> <laughs> You're asking me this, you know, my, my children are running around the uh, house. You know, it's our, it's our summertime and all of our summer camps and school, you know, activities got canceled. Opening schools is such a challenging question, you know, and all outbreaks are local at some, to some degree. And I think even if you look at the United States, we have such a different, we're having such a different experience across states right now. And Massachusetts is doing like, pretty well compared to some of our southern states that are in the height of their outbreak. So I think opening schools is again another place where you have to balance the missed opportunity of education for children and some children more than others. You know, the what children get in school is not just their education, but it's often their school lunch, their school breakfast. It's especially for children with learning disability, it's special needs. There's so many aspects to school that are important. And also many families who work have no other way to take care of their children. School is a way for their you know, childcare to happen. So I think it's really important to try to get back to schools, but it has to be able to happen in a way that's safe. What it looks like, I'm not a pediatrician, but it does look like smaller children under the age of 10 are less likely to be transmitting the infection when they, when they get infected. But we do have some children who get seriously ill. We are seeing some children who have immune response syndromes. So we can't just dismiss, especially when you have a large population of young people, the potential illness that can happen from those. I mean, a lot of the questions about schools, and I was actually just asked to join my own town's school reopening task force is about can you can you put in measures in the schools that will keep the teachers safe and the children as safe as possible can they stay do you have the space for the children to sit apart will the children be capable of wearing masks and do you have hand washing stations what will you do when the children are sick so i think and actually we can share with you uh, i'm happy to do that in an email and you can share with the group at Mass General in the Infectious Diseases Division, one of the pediatricians has gathered all of the data we know about schools and school reopening with an interest of sharing it widely. And we'll be, ha I'll be happy to share that with you because there's many, many studies and things to look at. Um, unfortunately, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we have the answer right now, but I'd love to hear what Prof. Carey says because I saw her daughter also <laughs> coming to join the discussions. <laughs> Um, I have a, a, a five and eight year old. And so I think it's been, um, it's hard, right? I, I think Prof. Fivers has really covered kind of the, the tension and I know you're all feeling that tension as well. I think it is important to realize that all outbreaks, I think in this case are kind of, are local to some degree. And so I think, um, you know, there is maybe an ability for some folks to open and they may have to close and flexibility. I think the hard part is that schools have to prepare for um, multiple scenarios, or you just say, we're gonna be remote. I think that the being remote model is tricky because I do think the cost to the children is huge. Here's the other challenge of COVID where we need more resources. And I am gonna get political for a moment, which is that 
if you're going to have schools reopen, you need a few things in place. One is you, you need better testing or better diagnosis criteria by which you're going to say you are dealing with a COVID outbreak because you're going to have to declare at some point you've crossed a threshold for it to be too unsafe to be gathered in school. Um, you also, though, very much need the ability to, um, you know, you also may need the ability to do remote learning, right? If you, not everybody has access to those resources, you may be kind of obligated to figure out how to figure out some socially distanced learning. But you need more money to go into schools to allow them to be prepared. I think just to speak for a moment about what's happening in the United States is that the current administration and president have said schools must open. We will not give you money unless you open. But oh, by the way, we're not going to give you any additional resources to figure out how to open, which may be more space, more desks, plexiglass, hand washing stations. If you can't go to the water bubbler anymore, how do you get your water during the day in a way that it's safe? So um, all I'm doing really is opening the Pandora's box of how complicated this is further without sort of and, and we're all doing the best we can in some ways, but I think it's terrific to share what resource and data there is because that some of that work has already been done and, and the degree that communities can find ways to kind of create their own systems and adapt to the moment may be the best way for us to go forward. All right, thank you very much for helping us with that difficult uh, question. And I look forward to those resources uh, to help us along. So we'll just take the very last question um, and just some brief comments on managing patients who have moderate severe disease but don't qualify for ICU issues. So, so if you don't have capacity to manage some of these patients with moderate to severe disease, um, do you have experience with that or...? Yeah, sorry, you cut out at the first round of the question. Um, so I think, you know, the COVID, if you look, the epidemiology of COVID is such that you really only have 20% of patients that should advance to needing hospitalization or advanced care. And of that subset, only the top 5% that would end up in a critical care ICU setting. Um, and I think that the things, that, and I think that within the capacity of what you can do, there's a number of things one can do. So one, if you do have access to high flow oxygen or the ability to even double down on nasal cannulas to ensure even more oxygen delivery, um, you can certainly try to support by just upping the oxygen delivery as much as possible, even in the absence of a ventilator. Where ventilators are important is that they, they deliver positive pressure ventilation. And as we know that happens, the lungs get um, inflamed and then they start to potentially get some fibrosis associated with ARDS and you need the that positive pressure is needed to kind of push these stiff lungs open. Um, if you don't have access to a ventilator um, or BiPAP which is aerosolizing so you need to think about that if you put the external ventilation on it will be aerosolizing um, to some degree um, and you only really have access to oxygen things that we know help is proning and you can prone people as long as they're willing to stay proned. Um, they're really, even though the protocols and the studies have said you sort of do, you know, 18 hours on, six off, and you flip people back and forth, we've left people proned for three days because they like it and it works and it can be game changing. And we've had people prone at home and we've had people prone in hospitals, not in the ICU. And so, I think using everything, all the tools short of ventilation can be very effective too. So think about diuresis to get any extra fluid off the lungs. Proning certainly can help. At this point, you would initiate dexamethasone. So I think that we there's a number of steps that can be taken and as much oxygen delivery as you can sort of muster. If you've access to high flow, the actual high flow oxygen, that is a terrific tool that um, there's, been debate about whether or not you can use, but around the United States, high flow oxygen has been used extremely effectively as a non-invasive ventilation strategy in COVID. It delivers a high amount of oxygen and enough air pressure, you know, going 60 liters a minute to actually provide even a little bit of peep that can be all the difference, that end expiratory pressure that can be all the difference in how to ventilate patients. Um, 
So I think that, you know, it's, it's sort of marching up the algorithm in all the ways that you can. The other thing to remember to be very thoughtful about is the clotting risk that happens in COVID. We know these patients clot very easily. And so certainly everybody should have some kind of prophylaxis if their clinical picture will allow for it. Um, and if you don't have access to things like, you know, sub-Q heparin or sub-Q anoxaparin, aspirin. Use, you know, just something as simple as aspirin can go a long way to help prevent clotting um, in these patients. And a low threshold to think about a DVT or a pulmonary embolus and a pathologic clot and the need to actually just empirically anticoagulate. I put a number of patients who were prone, intubated, failing, um, on anticoagulation empirically because there was no contraindication and we just watched them completely deescalate and get much better. So um, that would be a final thought. Uh, Prof. Fivers, I don't know if you have anything from an infectious disease standpoint or, no. So uh, those, are, those are just the thoughts from a critical care standpoint. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor I uh, Kerry and Professor Ivers uh, for this very insightful conversation and wishing you both the best as we all continue to fight this pandemic. I'll now hand over to Morris to officially close. Thank you. Well, from me again, just to, just to repeat the thanks, it was hugely impressive. I particularly enjoyed the discussion around going back to school. Our president has just started an address to the nation and I have no doubt that that'll be a, a hot topic uh, on his list. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll hear whether he listened to our webinar and uh, has taken your advice in, in what he says. But uh, thank you all so very much. Um, just a reminder to our attendees, uh, the poll has appeared on your screen. Please do fill it in. It'll take you a couple of seconds. Helps us uh, plan future webinars. And uh, yes, just uh, to all of you, keep, keep safe and keep strong, and uh, we look forward to joining you again next week. Thank you. Thank you.